the essence of the kind of core, the heart of Buddhism, its very essence is is uh, to awaken individuals to out of just habitual conditioned behavior to awaken to reality. And so like in uh, the word Buddha itself, it's, it's not a name of a person really, it's a, it means awakened like a human being who is awakened to reality. And then you may wonder what I mean by reality, <clears throat> because most of us think, you know, the, the world we live in, our own thoughts and experiences are the real world, is reality. And, but and it's not, it's the, we live in, in a world we create out of our fears and desires, and so then this, the Buddhist teaching is to awaken out of that realm of fear and desire to Dhamma, like the, the Pali word Dhamma is like reality, the truth, the absolute truth, the way things really are. And, and so then the practice of meditation is, uh, is ways of be, you know, developing that and learning to recognize within your own mind reality, uh, not in terms of cultural assumptions or personal preferences or even religion, but it's, it's, a, it's an awakeness to what is natural, what is true. Uh, and, and of course, you can't describe it. It's not descriptions, definitions are limited to uh, our thinking process. And so we we live in a world that we create with our own percep conditioned perceptions. And then the, the mindfulness practice is uh, the developing awareness of that, you know, getting, not just getting caught in in the momentum of our thinking and views and opinions, but being able to observe them from a position of, of awareness and understanding, not in terms of worldly values, but in terms of uh, the reality of, of existence. So <clears throat> we're now living in a world, you know, we have to live within the limitation of our physical form, our body, and and the body is a, a sensitive form. So we're born, you know, from <clears throat> our mothers, and we, you know, we're born, we're a conscious form, human form, and, um, and it's a sensitive form, you know, so the physical body itself, then we have seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. We, we have a retentive memory, so we remember have to remember all kinds of things uh, from the past. Uh, and so we, you know, we, we, we become complicated because uh, we, we identify t totally with our physical form, with the body. And then when, you, when a baby's born, then it, it doesn't, you know, it's conscious, it has consciousness, which is natural. And then a body, a natural body, and then and then it feels. It has pleasure, pain, neutral sensations. It knows when it's hungry and pain and, and sleepy and so forth. So there's this kind of instinctual intelligence operating from the beginning, and it's not. It's just natural intelligence, not not created by culture or personal identities. But then after that, then the, the mother, father, the society starts informing us, you know, you get reward and punishment, you know, you're a good boy, you're a bad boy, that kind of thing. <clears throat> you obey mom and she praises you and you disobey and you get punished and so forth. So this is, uh, you know, we're conditioned to try to 
to survive within the family and the so social milieu that we're a part of. And, and so, but we form an identity of a separate self, you know, an ego. And, uh, and cultural identity, social identity, identity with your body, male or female, the uh, identity with whether you consider yourself, uh, whether your parents love you or don't, or <clears throat> your, you know, you form a sense of your self-worth in the early, you know, kind of fi gets fixed in the adolescent years. And all this is conditioned, <clears throat> you know, through, in, in Buddhist terms, through ignorance of, of reality, just, this just happens to us. Like an innocent child just absorbs, it's like a sponge, it just takes on what's ever around, it doesn't, you know, discriminate really, it just, has to survive because it's helpless, dependent, you know, on the mother at first, totally dependent, and so forth. So it has to, you know, it picks up the, the feelings, the, the prejudices, the biases, the social identities, and all that from just through absorption. <clears throat> and then we form our identity as an individual person, personality uh, uh, convention, you know, we identify with our ethnic background, our class, race, gender, uh, and with the culture, with the religion, all these affect us and how we, we interpret experience and life. And then the, the Buddhas practice is to awaken to that. It's not a critical function, it's not like trying to get rid of it, it's just putting it in a in a context where we're no longer just helpless victims of our conditioning or our habits. Otherwise, you know, on a, otherwise we tend to, you know, be stuck if we're, you know, with a lot of fears and opinions and views <clears throat> that uh, we acquire from others and uh, social attitudes and so and that, that that we have no perspective on. We operate, we interpret our experience, interpret our self-worth through these distortions. So the, that's why we, ha we suffer, you know, this sense of suffering uh, because we're living in a world of, that's not real, but which we don't know anything outside it. So, the Buddha addressed this issue very, very directly with his first sermon in the Four Noble Truths teaching. So, when he was enlightened 2,556 years ago or so, he, uh, you know, he, he saw, he awakened to reality. He saw Dhamma. So you've got these words Buddha, Dhamma, and it's Buddha that knows Dhamma. And, and, it, and this, these are Pali uh, words, but they're quite significant because uh, it's not me knowing Dhamma. You know, Ajahn Samedo knows the Dhamma. It's, a, it's like you, when you develop mindfulness practice, then your refuge is in knowing in this Bhutto, in this awareness. So it's non-personal. And Dhamma isn't about, you know, a person, it's about reality. So in, within this limitation of a human form, we can awaken to ultimate reality. Uh, even we have all these other, <clears throat> you know, we're living in a realm that's continuously pressing on us. You know, just look at your own life. How it's a, endless, you know, you're endlessly being irritated through uh, the conditions around you, uh, you know, day or night, uh, heat or cold, uh, the weather by, uh, you know, the alignment of the stars, the sun and the moon, and, and then the uh, society you're in, and your own personal uh, habits, and what we see, you know, hear, smell, taste, touch, 
think and feel. This is a, this is an experience of total sensitivity. You know, so every human being is is in this state of total sensitivity from birth to death. In fact, all of the cre cre animals are, but <clears throat> but um, we're uh, we're aware of this. You know, we we think about it. We 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 have a retentive memory where we can create a totally false, totally deluded scenario of life and and what you know self worth and and so forth. So we have endless wars, conflicts, disagreements. Uh, you know, with each other or different national identities and religious identities, so we fight with each other about these or class identities. You know, so when you look at read the news, you know, it's all about this ignorance of one group. You know, saying we're right, you're wrong, you're the you're the enemy, and so forth. It's all just you know. Ever since I <clears throat> was born. This has been going on, <laughs> and no doubt before. But the uh, and this is because of this ignorance. It's not knowing dhamma, not awakening to reality. And so now you, we have a population of what nine billion or so people on the planet, and. Uh, and when I was born, there were about two billion or something. So I mean, just in eighty years, it's. <laughs> and so I mean, the, you know, you have, you know, how do we, how do we relate to you know this this world is pressure pre, is like a pressure cooker right now, and everything's you know fast moving fast with the technology and. And in one, some ways it's better, in some ways it's getting worse. But this is the way conditioned phenomena operates. You know, as long as we're identified on this level of, of a human form, a human personality, social, cultural identities, political identities, view, personal views and opinions, then you know, our, our life is going to be one of conflict because nobody can have the same views. You know, you can't get nine million people to think in the same way or believe in the same God or whatever. It's just, or have the same political, you know, you know, we, we all prescribe, you know, now democracy is the, the word, you know, everybody wants democracy. But what do we mean by that? Nobody quite knows anymore. It's kind of a, Generic term that includes, you know, how do you define it? And uh, but it's it's you know an ideal we have of you know a fair government. But you know the samsara isn't about fairness; it's about change. It's not about equality and peace. It's about conflict and change and and suffering, pain and. And uh, so we have the natural force, like the the cyclone in the Philippines recently, just last week, this uh, devastating cyclone, you know, Mother Nature, or is it God's retribution? Maybe he's punishing the Filipinos. <laughs> you can interpret any way you want, or uh, you know, depending on your your proclivity and the way you're conditioned to think. <clears throat> And so, like like awakening to reality is is learning to develop a trust in your ability to just observe. And so, this is like mindfulness. Is the English word mindfulness is it means our ability to be in the to wake into the present moment. Usually, we're mindful about things like crossing a busy street. You know. Yeah, you know, you told you have to look right and left and see what's coming. You have to bring into your attention out of self-preservation, just physical survival. You know, so you're not walking into the middle of an ongoing lorry or something. That, but and so we are mindful when we we're supposed to be mindful when we're driving a car. And so you're not supposed to be drunk. <laughs> 
or you're not supposed to be talking on your cell phone while you're driving, especially, you know, the government now makes these rules wanting you to concentrate on, you know, the traffic in front and the signs and and that to be mindful because you're driving a, a, a dangerous vehicle, you know, you could kill people with it. And so driving is, you know, it's, it's about survival, you've got to you know, be on the alert just for survival. When, when you're, if you're a rock climber, you know, you talk to rock climbers about that, they, they're totally mindful. I asked one once, I said, why, why do you do that? You know, it's so dangerous. You know, you're climbing these sheer cliffs and, and you've got to, you know, just one misstep, one false move, you could just fall, drop, and die. And they said, well, you know, when you're climbing a, a rock face, you're not worried anymore. You're just totally with, uh, with the situation. <laughs> you, know, you, have to, you can't have to worry about paying the electric bill or your relationship with your wife. You've got to be with just the, the reality of your body on the rock face. And that's, that, that is, you know, because of the imminent threat of death, you know, it's, it's very, you know, it's right there in your face. So you don't, you, you forget everything else and just concentrate on, on what you're doing, where your hands are, your feet. But in uh, <clears throat> daily life, you know, we like security and we have, have uh, locks on the doors and <clears throat> We have central heating and air conditioning, and we can go into our flat and you know from having a from rock from climbing a rock face, get back to your flat, lock the door, <clears throat> and you got this sense of safety, and so you can sit there and you know think about climbing the rock face and and suddenly start shaking with fear. <laughs> <laughs> because just the memory, you know, what you really put yourself into uh, is, can be very frightening when you think about it. So this is, our human minds are like this, when, when danger is that we have an instinctual self-preservation mechanism. Uh, uh, probably you've experienced it when you, you know, when, you're, when your life, physical existence has been threatened something in you opens immediately to the situation and you you react in a way that you can't believe you know you could do it because how you see yourself when you're in your cozy flat safe from everything is is not the same person that's having to face a, a, you know a, something very dangerous in the, in the immediate present so one time here, in this very monastery, I was, I was uh, living in a kuti, and it had a, a bathroom underneath, and then the room was above that with a porch. And so I was going down, I went into the, the bathroom, and uh, there were just little cement cubicles, I closed the door, put the latch on and I turned around there was a cobra there in the same you know it's a very small place and it was coming at me like this and uh, and my response was surprised me when I started thinking about it you know suddenly I saw and, I, and immediately I just leaped over this this angry cobra and and opened the door and got out and, and then the, the cobra left. And when I started thinking about it, I started shaking with fear because, you know, here I was trapped. And, and yet, and, and I wouldn't have been able to think that out. I didn't, but I must leap over this cobra. It was spontaneous. And so maybe many of you have had these kind of 
experiences where where you're actually physically endangered and you respond in a way that can be quite amazing, you know, that you, you don't, you had not planned, but it was a spontaneous response to danger. We have that, but it, it, so much of life now is safe, you know, has this illusion of safe security uh, and we can become neurotic in a safe, in that security. We, we can sit in our cozy flats and and stir up anger and hatred and resentment and feeling sorry for ourselves and and uh, get really, you know, neurotic, create endless scenarios of uh, problems in our mind because of the safety. You can't do that climbing a rock face. You've got to just be with the moment. So that, like this is the like um, the mindfulness practice then is, is it, we're not trying to seek dangerous situations, you know, to, just to, you know, to, to be mindful, but as a place like this, you know, it's fairly, people are trustworthy and we all have a standard of morality and we, we you know, we, we make agreements on how to live with each other so we're not, you know, we, we, we're not kind of, uh, in a situation that that we have to compete with each other or defend ourselves, uh, so there's a certain amount of safety, a moral standard, encouragement of practice, some <coughs> mindfulness, and then <coughs> to develop this mindfulness in ordinary situations. You know, so you, you know, you wait till you, a cobra is chasing you, but here and now when everything is, you know, nothing much, there's no present danger, no immediate need to be mindful. But this, the Vipassana practices of the Buddha are about awakening and being mindful here and now. And so that is, uh, you know, that's what we do to, to cultivate this mindfulness in our daily lives. Don't worry about it when when your life's in danger, but where we are most in danger is in the, the seeming security and safety of daily life, where we can really, you know, that's where people commit suicide or, you know, do terrible things in the, you know, in a society that, where there's guaranteed safety laws and policemen and CCTV cameras and and uh, guard dogs and locks <laughs> rules and whatnot to have this sense of security. So, you know, over the years, this is mainly what I've done. I've been a monk now for uh, forty-eight years. So, it's it's like uh, developing this. First you have a kind of, you have the insight, kind of flashes of awareness and, and that kind of awaits you, you know there's something beyond just the, the, just the momentum of your own mind and your own habits as you begin to, to be more aware of them. And this awareness is now, you know, it, it, it as you begin to recognize it and trust it, then it, it, it integrates into the flow of your life, whatever that might be, you know, whether you're a monk or a nun or lay person or living in Thailand or in another country. It's not about, it is not dependent upon a situation, but it integrates into whatever you have to do with your life, you know, <clears throat> with the people you live with and the position you're in. And now, like in, I've lived in uh, in England f for 34 years teaching like this, and uh, I went uh, to London in 1977 because there was an interest there and uh, there was a lot of 
and I was invited to go and and the, this awareness now practices is, is you know you hear it all the time you talk you know psychotherapy and everything is now beginning to recognize the value of these practices where in, in, you know 1977 in London the psychologists psychotherapists uh, I never heard them talk about mindfulness or awareness and uh, it was a word that just wasn't in the in the consciousness and meditation then <clears throat> you know you told people you were practicing they think you were doing something really strange what's that you know and it uh, like uh, some kind of strange Asian practice <laughs> but now everybody does it uh, you know it's, it's common you know it's the, even on the national health system in UK um, you know meditation practice because it, it, it is uh, you know it, it works it's it, it is a way to resolve your own kind of problems and, and, and I mean, it's, of course it's not invasive you're not you don't have to swallow medicine or inject things into your body you're just learning to, to pay attention and your attention isn't just looking out and, like if we pay attention you know we tend to look outward and then we, we our critical mind starts operating you know I don't like this we become aware of what's wrong and the things that aren't don't suit us on, you know, on say externally and where you know educated people <clears throat> are like this we develop our critical faculty to a high degree we read a lot we have a lot of information we know what's right and wrong and true and false and good and bad and that so you know we our our educational system our culture uh, 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 you know fulfills its role of developing our critical faculties, our thinking mind. The thinking mind is for discriminating. This is big, small, good, bad, and so forth. So it has its, you know, it has its use. But as a, as if we operate only from the critical mind, then we end up with doubt and, and, uh, resentments and and we don't we don't get behind we don't get beyond the critical uh, conditioning and so then the intuitive awareness like I use the word intuition because uh, I mean an English word but it really is like being mindful in the moment it's you, when you're intuitive it's in the present moment you know you know it's not about the past or the future about the present and it's you you kind of pick up in a in a general way you know you're aware uh, say of the atmosphere or the the feeling of the moment you know uh, both internally and externally you know you you we have this ability to feel life rather than just project our own views opinions on everything and and ignore it and so then the you know what impinges on us affects our minds so even a, you know a, a hostile atmosphere where maybe nobody's showing any any kind of outward hostility but inwardly they hate you you can feel it <laughs> you know it is it, this is an intuitive intelligence operating so it's a discerning ability it's uh, to discern it's not a critical it's not saying you shouldn't hate me uh, it's not about how you should be or uh, but it's 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 discerning it's like this so it, it's not descriptive it's just noticing uh, and in the present you because of the sense of your your position and and uh, things around you it's like this and so it's uh, it's it's undefinable but recognizable realizable and this is how you you begin to train yourself with this awareness because you know it's not from because 
the external things also affect you, your emotional nature and, and, and then you're, you feel this kind of anxiety maybe or threat but if you're just thinking all the time and you're very idealistic caught up in the realm of, of your own views, opinions and self-importance then you don't recognize what you're feeling you just you can ignore it and just get go on a tirade about you know we've got to get rid of this dictator and build a democracy and <laughs> plan a revolution and and uh, you know plans for the future so but that that's why we can think of we can create ideals of perfection with our thinking mind because we can think we can think high or low we can think the ultimate best you know where everybody's where everybody loves each other we're all filled with metta and compassion loving kindness and compassion that's an, that's an ideal you know that beautiful ideal and it should be like that but this is the way it is right now you see so you're not you know if you're not and, and so the way it is right now is like this and and that maybe it's not like that maybe at this moment uh, nobody's loving each other they're all caught up in anger resentment hatred and views and opinions but and so it's then if, if one is attached to these high-minded ideals then you always feel anxiety and threat because you know we all should love each other but this is not the way it is but it should be like like the ideal but and it shouldn't be this way now the, the intuitive awareness then is the ability to observe that you know how we react uh, our habitual reactions to situations and, and through that awareness you begin to put your I you know your ability to create ideal situations your views opinions your emotional reactions to the experience of the moment the anxiety the fear restlessness infatuations whatever is like this you see and this is where wisdom operates in this this is a, like a a higher intelligence or universal intelligence it's not conditioned by culture it's not cultural it's not religious even it's uh, universal so we all share this we all have this ability but we're limited always by our own limit the limitations we, we impose on our consciousness all the time so the, over the years, like the training uh, uh, with Lung Po Cha, and and over these years of you know developing this practice, you know you you can actually you know prove this to yourself. It's not a matter of just accepting the Lung Po Cha's word or my word or the Buddha's word in the scriptures, but it's to be you know recognize in your in your you know for yourself so it's not just secondhand or acquired knowledge it's 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 uh, insight knowledge it's like the taste of honey you know you can describe you can if you've never tasted honey and I say it's really delicious you know what delicious means and it's very sweet you know like sugar you know what sweet sugar is you say what's the chemical formula I could look up on the internet chemical formula for honey and give you that <laughs> and but only till you taste it do you really know the, the flavor <laughs> and then you know for yourself you know you're not depending on me to tell you you know how wonderful it is it's as simple as that it's tasting knowing directly Now, do you have any questions? <laughs> How do we know between 
Because, like with mindfulness, your views are always formed with thoughts. You know, you have to think to have a viewpoint. But the intuitive awareness is is awareness of thinking. You know, this is where, you know, usually we 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 experience rea what we think is real. We have to have a name. You know, this this is real because we call this a spittoon, and, it, and it's solid. You can see it. And, and we all agree, you know, the Thais don't call this a spittoon, they call it a katon. Katoon? Katoon. And, um, <coughs> but we all know that you spit into it. And, <laughs> and so that's, that's the real world for many people, you know, you have, you have a definite form that everybody agrees that this is what it's for. And, and you know, like in the West, we never you know, we didn't really uh, use them. And then one, this was years ago in, in England, uh, some wealthy Thai woman gave me a spittoon, a big one like this, had a brass rim, it was blue painted, you know, designs on white, quite beautiful. And so I thought, well, this is too beautiful to spit into. So. What I did was I filled it with sand, put it on the shrine to put joss sticks in. So, and, and all of us, you know, international, there weren't Thai monks there at the time, just, uh, you know, from different European countries, so they, you know, nobody had any objection to it. And then one, one evening, a high, very high-ranking Thai monk came, uh, and a very famous one, came into Chithurst and we took him to the shrine room and he saw the, the spittoon on the shrine and he said, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> that's for spinning and do. <laughs> and then, like that's, that, you know, you, now I couldn't do that because I don't see this is what you're spinning to. But before I could see it as like a vase or a, dish or whatever, you know, and defined it as only uh, for spitting. And this is the, what we do with life. We, we get very fixed in, in the, you know, with the, with the conditions we have. And this is, this is the, what it's for and you can't use it for anything else. Um, and so the mind, you know, you, it, before I started meditating, I was, I was really I realized something was wrong uh, with, you know, I had, I had felt suffocated with my own uh, thinking process. And, uh, you know, just felt, you know, that it's too, it's, some, it's like wearing straitjacket. It was always pressing in. It's too narrow. Is there something outside of that that you can, you know, get out of this trap of just being stuck in, in your own thoughts and opinions and views, fears and desires, and this is this is one reason why I had already had an interest in Buddhism, but I never practiced it, never developed it. I'd read about it, and mainly in the the Zen Buddhist type of Buddhism, which was the popular form at that time in the, in the States. And uh, that I found, you know, hopeful with that because Zen Buddhism has, you know, it has this kind of opening the mind up in a different way that, that the American uh, system doesn't. You know, it's a completely different kind of take on reality. And it fascinated me, but I didn't know how to do it. And that's one reason why I, I came to Thailand to find uh, somebody to teach me how to, how to do that. <laughs> Given the uh, 48 years of, uh, of your, your presence in, in the Buddhist world and you've seen it uh, grow, especially, and I'm referring specifically to the Western Sangha and the, the Western practice of Buddhism, and you've seen it and you've, you've played a key role in, in this uh, Growth, you know, almost tremendous growth of, of the past year specifically.
specifically? Where do you see it going in the next, say, 50 years? Well, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's developed beyond, even in my lifetime, beyond what I ever expected. And, uh, the, you know, I've been invited all over the world and it was, you know, every, there's an interest in, in Buddhist meditation and in, in almost every country. And, um, you know, this is a good sign. And now with, with uh, in, like now you've got, everything's on the internet and, and you easily get, you know, information about Buddhism and different schools of Buddhism and teachers and whatnot. So this wasn't possible back when I, you know, I, start, I became interested around 1955. I was in the, American Navy and in Japan and in Zen Buddhism and then there wasn't much available in English you know I think Alan Watts The Way of Zen and uh, they were republishing T.T. Suzuki's you know he, he was a Japanese master but he wrote in English and and they'd been out of print for I never heard of them before. I think they they've been published in the 30s, 1930s, and in the and of course they weren't generally known by anybody. And they started publishing those in paperbacks in America. So I got uh, you know when I, in San Francisco I went to bookshop and found this book on Zen Buddhism by Ichi Suzuki. And something in me just I was about 21 years old then, so it was you know, like a awakening for me. I used to go out in Golden Gate Park by myself, you know, just read D.T. Suzuki and get high on it. I didn't need marijuana or anything. <laughs> D.T. Suzuki did it. <laughs> and uh, it has something in me responds to this, this style. You know, I don't know why, because I brought up as a Christian. I'm not you know, in my cultural social background don't don't explain it in any way. What it is, I don't know, but it, I certainly relate to Buddhism in a way and I don't relate to anything else. And, and I followed that over the years. And that, but I thought, you know, you think of yourself as, a, you know, you're you're kind of an odd character anyway, and you know, you you, you always, you know, I used to think of myself as just not really fitting well into this society I was born into, a misfit. And uh, even though I could get by, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was generally good experience with life, but it was a feeling. And, and I couldn't relate to Christianity. I just, well, you know, it didn't, didn't reach me. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Where with Buddhism, it, because they don't ask you to believe in anything, then then I could trust that. And because I'm a I have a skeptical mind, it's a you know doubting mind. And of course, Zen Buddhism addresses that. All there are always these koans that don't make any sense. Throw your your mind into what is the sound of one hand clapping. Your mind goes blank. You know, uh, <laughs> impossible conundrums. You know, they throw at you. It's to, because that really it's a way of of getting to look at your consciousness. You know, not knowing. You know, we. You, when you're brought up in a, in a society where you're supposed to know a lot and you're praised for knowing all kinds of facts and figures and details and all that, not knowing is is just not acceptable. You know, it's just you, you've got to you should know, have a have something defined, have it categorized, labeled. But not knowing is is like you're stupid or you know, you, it's some, you should know 
And so you, when, you, when, you, when I would be thrown into the state of doubt or not knowing, then I'd, you know, I always wanted an answer, a solution to a problem, answer to a question. <laughs> but then in the, in the mindfulness practice, you're aware of that. And then Ajahn Chah's great teaching is not, don't know. You know, so he's, he's you know, he's uh, in Thai, my na. My na in Thai means don't know. And so uh, this, this doesn't sound like anything worth knowing. <laughs> but what it is, is my na and not, don't know is, you know, it's like you, if you're willing to not know something and accept that, you're, you're aware of pure conscious, the reality of pure consciousness. You know, it's, it's, it's a discerning, it's here and now, it's realizable. But you can't know it as an object, like this you can know as an object, but consciousness, because we're all experiencing it right now, it's all the same. But we don't know consciousness, we operate from reacting to the, the stimulation of our that, that goes through the consciousness. So in the, and that's what we, we live in this, this, this realm of irritation, agitation, change and, and uh, time elements and fears and desires all come into that. But beyond all these moving things is pure consciousness. And, uh, and it's the same for all, it's not a personal consciousness. Not, you know, not I have it and you don't or something. We're all, it's exactly the same for all of us. And so when we recognize that, then we have perspective on the, what we have to deal with uh, our own karmic habits or contingencies or things that happen to us in life. We have perspective, we're not just helpless helplessly trapped in maybe unwholesome reactions and fears and, and things that we tend to be if we don't know this. Like fear is, you know, this is a fear realm we're living in. It's all about death and uh, survival so you you know we have we have these very vulnerable bodies to live in you know and, and they're very sensitive and vulnerable and uh, you know there anything could happen to them and so there's a natural anxiety and fear about survival you know it just is a physical entity we, you know, our skin is not very tough, not like rhinoceros. Uh, you know, we can't compete with with gazelles in running. Uh, to tackle an elephant, we know we lose. <laughs> or a raging lion. <laughs> and so, I mean, the, you know, we're kind of a species that, you know, we don't have much hair. Uh, you know, we don't have really good claws, and, and how do we survive? You know, we have this intelligence, you know, where we can create weapons and for protection, and bows and arrows, and axes, and nuclear bombs, and whatnot. So, I mean, it, this, is, this is how to use this intelligence just for survival or protection. Uh, for me or for our country or whatever, but we know that how dangerous it is now with nuclear power. And no, no longer bows and arrows and swords. It's you know mass destruction is is the potential now worldwide. So this creates anxiety. This realm is like this. You know this this is a. a, a realm of fear and you just watch the animals in the jungles here you know they 
they operate on survival. It's all about survival. But we can, you know, the human society, we can make moral agreements and laws about behavior. So we all agree, you know, that murdering somebody else is, is wrong. And yet we can all have moments where we want to murder somebody. So it's, <laughs> it's not that, that we're, uh, you know, we never experienced that, that impulse, but we uh, have a moral, moral agreement not to do it. And, uh, and then we're punished by the society if we, we do. And, and so this is, this is one of the, you know, the good things of our human, human state. We can, we still have these animal instincts and, and, uh, reactions to things, but we can agree on behavior. You know, not to murder each other or lie to each other. In monasticism, you have this vinai, we very, you know, detailed precepts about behavior and speech. And that's why it works, because we, you know, this is a what by not a child international forest monastery so you've got every nationality around and uh, but we all you know if you become a bhikkhu then you agree to live under the the structure of vinaya and it makes our life we, we live with each other and it doesn't mean we like each other love each other agree with each other uh, but it, we, we don't uh, you know we respect, we have forms of respect and ways of dealing, you know, in which we, we, we do, we agree on the behavioral level. What, what we feel personally can, is going to be different with every, every individual. And this, this makes our life easy because we, we can live with each other like this uh, because of, of these agreements. Now, to me, this is the, this is what the greatness of being human, because we can, uh, because you know, I've seen it myself. All the, you know, desires, of, of, you know, jealousies and fears and anger and rage and <coughs> and uh, liking and disliking and. Resenting and so forth, because you're you're mindful of what's going on in inside you. But on the behavior level, we 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 try to live within that structure. And now you know, like worldwide, the infinite problems of peace agreements and resolving conflicts. There's there's not a moral structure involved in it. It was power. And uh, like not killing, you know, nobody, it's all right to kill if it's your enemy. <laughs> and, you know, President Obama can send a drone over and kill somebody in Pakistan. It's, he's not, it's just, a, you know, part of his duty to wipe out the enemy, even though it's in another country. But if you, you know, our, the first precept is the bana di bana, not to intentionally kill another human. And, uh, and that is an important moral agreement. But, it's, you know, if, if all the world decided to keep that one precept, the war would, would stop. <laughs> the, <laughs> You're not supposed to go around killing the enemies anymore. And, and uh, th this is where, we, you know, we lack that wisdom now. We don't, we don't have that understanding. We just think the end justifies the means. You know, so you invade Iraq, kill millions of Iraqis. I mean, it's, you know, collateral damage. We're sorry about it, but necessary. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, it's dismissed as, uh, you know, t well, you know, we're very sorry, you know, but 
we got rid of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> so it's, you know, nobody feels this sense of moral uh, integrity about it. And this is, you know, if we're going to nine, mil, nine billion people can live with each other, we, it's very important to bring into the mind. You can't force it on them. You can't, you know, it's something you have to to take on. You know, like moral precepts, there's something you have to recognize. You know, if I say you should keep the five precepts and force them on you, it won't work. Then you just feel tyranny from me, you know, you just, that monk's just browbeating me into doing this and, and you just feel my tyranny. You don't recognize maybe the profanity of the precepts you've taken. So that's why in, uh, here in Thailand, you, to take the five precepts, you, you have to ask for them. You know, we can't say you have to take them. Uh, but you have to come to a monk and, and say, please, may I have the five precepts? And you have to say it three times before the monk can do it. So that makes it, you know, something that you rise up to. You're not just being told what to do by a priest, but you're actually taking on that in your own request. And that that's, that's a mature way, you know, because you're, you know, if I just tell you, you, you go to hell if you don't keep the five precepts, you'll never grow up, even if you believe me and keep the five precepts. You know, you, you need always to be told what to do, where rather than being told, you're, you know, you're encouraged to, to contemplate the value of this and, and then ask for it and then try to live within that structure. Of, it's just about, be, about decent behavior towards yourself and others. So what is it like being human being? You know, we're strange animals really. We've got the animal body, you know, not that much different from a chimpanzee. And then we, and then we, we've got this reflective mind. We have to remember everything. So, you know, we've, so we have to remember all kinds of things we wish we could forget because of this retentive memory. <clears throat> so one, one time I was, I was walking in the north of England in the Pennine, in, no, in, the, in Yorkshire, Dales, I was on this kind of camping trip and uh, I was with another monk and a layman, and we came in the springtime. In the Yorkshire Dales, is really beautiful. You know, it's kind of wildflowers and beautiful feeling of of uh, spring, and and then the, the, these hills. And I heard this terrible kind of wailing in the distance. <clears throat> I didn't know what it was, so I asked. The layman who who knows the area, what is, I hear this this kind of wailing sound. What is it? And he said, "Oh, that's probably you know on the other side of the hill. The shepherd just took away the newborn lambs from their mothers, and the mothers are grieving the loss of their lambs. And this was you know I could hear this. This was just like a." human woman crying, you know, if you took a, a baby away from its mother and, and uh, this, this is grief. So actually, she, yous, experience grief at loss and we have that same, we have that same experience. Grief at the loss of the loved is common to us and sheep. But sheep don't remember that much longer, so <laughs> <coughs> they get over it quickly. But a human woman, it could ruin her life. It could, you know, destroy her life. 
and she'd be caught in resentment, anger, and because of her memory, retentive memory. So that is, this is the, the curse of having a retentive memory, but the, the good thing is that it gives us this reflective ability, you know, to, to reflect on experience, to have language, to describe and define things. But the, the wisdom level is not about the value of things, but of discerning the difference between like uh, the purity of consciousness and the conditions that arise in it. So, you know, like they, they say all conditions are impermanent. All conditioned phenomena is impermanent. Sapes and Karani Cha. And so it, it's a, a statement of to be reflected on. And then that which is aware of conditions, it's not, awareness isn't picking and choosing the conditions, it's where the, the, what the feeling now, the, the experience now through the senses and that is, and we reflect on the changing of something rather than on what we think of it and our opinion about it, whether we want it or don't want it, it's just like this. So your, your mind is open in this wide spectrum of awareness and discerns this change, both internally, you know, in subtle ways or coarse ways. And uh, this is intuitive intelligence. And this is where, when, in Buddhist term, where wisdom operates where we understand in a profound way, rather than just think we understand because we, we know the theories that we've acquired from others. And then the, you know, in 1956, 1955, when I became interested in Buddhism, there wasn't there was this kind of, in San Francisco, this kind of beat Zen thing going on, which was a beginning, really, a beginning where, you know, these kind of rebellious people, young people, were rebelling against the, the status quo of the kind of white middle-class Protestant mentality. It was so kind of fixed and and, and rigid. So, I mean, they were like thumbing their nose, making fun of and condemning, <laughs> doing everything you shouldn't be doing if you were a good Christian, Protestant, white, middle-class girl or boy. <laughs> did everything the opposite. Which was, was kind of fun, you know, to rebel against the establishment. but. But also there is this uh, growing interest in Zen Buddhism because it seemed like a, a kind of rebellion or way of different way of thinking, and then many of us started with that, and then and then of course the beatnik thing didn't last very long, but it it was it was a sign of a change because ever since 1955 there's uh, this it's been this growing interest in countries that are not Buddhist at all, like the, like Britain or United States, all over, you know, and now it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. And that's a good thing. <clears throat> How it moves into the society, I don't know. But I do know, like in, in, in England, for example, the, the psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapists, are talking a lot about mindfulness now, which they didn't, you know, before. And uh, there's mindfulness practices, and this is, is quite in the States, and this is, these are quite, you know, they're recognizing this in a kind of worldly way, the value of resolving your, a lot of your emotional habits through awareness. I think that's good, you know, it's a, it's a good direction to encourage. Because, you know, the, 
who knows what's going to happen, you know, in the future. Is an unknown. And, but it, that's why I encourage you to, to trust yourself to know now. You know, not don't worry about the future, but to develop this awareness practice now so that whatever the changes might be, you, you'll be able to, re, to adapt and survive within those, within the changing conditions that you have no control over, if you, if you have this kind of wisdom available. And even in in uh, different religions, it you know that like Christian mysticism, you read, you know what is Saint John of the Cross, or that, and they you know they refer to it, but it's not so clearly stated. It's more or less by default. Where in the Buddhist the Buddhist practice, it's it's the main teaching. Like in uh, why did he take suffering? And 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 place it in the in the top, the noble truth, first noble truth. And you go to interfaith meetings in London and uh, other religions, and they they all ask, well, Buddhism doesn't believe in God. You don't have a God. Why do you always talk about suffering? You know, we talk about love and God and and those. You know, and you talk about suffering. So it makes you think, you know, why? <laughs> you know, love and God are kind of inspiring, you know, especially for most people, love. He's talking about love and people get very inspired by that. But, and God, some people really, you know, find that inspiring. Other people just get angry about it. But <clears throat> these are, you know, words that, are, that tend to inspire the mind. Inspiration is, you know, gives you you know, it has its purpose, but it has no self-sustaining ability. You can't, you know, you can't, you, you know, it, it comes and then it goes and then you have to get, find something to inspire you again. So, the Buddha used suffering, which is not inspiring, <laughs> but which is, we all suffer, you know, it's easily seen. You know, you know, every one of us, you know, whether you're rich or poor, whatever, has the same thing. It's banal, it's ordinary. It's what none of us want. None of us want it. We want to get rid of it. But then you're changing from running away, seeking happiness, ignoring suffering, to understanding it. That's a significant shift. You know, as, a, as an individual human, you're just changing from just trying to find happiness and to looking at suffering, not indulging in it or, but you're, you're, it's a noble truth, so not just something you have to grit your teeth and endure because it's a nasty fact of life. It's not asking you to do that, grin and bear it. Look at it. You're changing from one reacting to it to observing it. And that's, that's a very significant change in, in, in uh, you know, a shift, to like a quantum leap from being just an ordinary person seeking happiness to being an individual developing wisdom. And then, the, then as you the, follow that, the Four Noble Truths and the formula that I have, you, you begin to recognize non-suffering, like the pure consciousness. There's not there's no suffering there. It's not it's not a suffering reality. The suffering comes and goes in it, and if all we know is what comes and goes, then that's why we we're worried, anxious, neurotic, frightened, resentful, and that because we're caught in it in just the momentum of change all the time where with mindfulness and like uh, intuitive awareness you're, 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 you're transcending the condition, you're looking at it, you're not dismissing it or annihilating it, you're, you're, 
your relationship to it changes from becoming that condition to observing. It's this knowing. It's like this. So it is to encourage you Uh, you know, to, and it also, it takes, like the big problem I found teaching in, in the West was, um, people, you know, well-educated, intelligent people are, tend to be very self-critical too. Like in, in England, there's people tend to, to emphasize the weaknesses, the faults they have as their reality. And so they don't learn that they don't have they tend to see themselves in, in negative perceptions. I'm not good enough, I can't do it, I uh, you know, I've got, I've got to I'm I'm a some emotional mess, I've got to get rid of this. I'm you know, and so they they in a way they they kind of see their suffering, but they're identified with it. <clears throat> and, it and, and that identity, you know, you're wanting to get them to look. That's a created identity. It's not what you really are. In a sense. But they, the people, you know, tend to believe that, that the, these, these negative perceptions is what they really are. And so you encouraging them to change, just shift from, you know, to clinging to these identities and believing them to observing them. And if you can get somebody to do that, <laughs> <coughs> then they can, you know, whatever problems they do have, they, they, their relationship to it changes from just being a helpless victim of, of their habits to being using wisdom to resolve and let go of the very things that make them suffer. And so it's like learning to trust this this awareness. I, I used to tell them trust this awareness. And uh, and I, I used to think you know, like, like with Ajahn Chah, I trusted him more than myself in the beginning. You know, he's the wise master. I'm the neurotic disciple. He knows, but I don't. So I want him to tell me, and because um, that's how it seemed at the time. You know, I. He seemed wise, and I didn't. I, I, and I didn't. I didn't see myself as wise at all. So, I, you know, I, I trusted his view of me, and uh, and he saw that. And so he'd always, say, you know, you know, he always pointed out, you know, how should I know? You, you're the one that that should know what's going on. And you know, so he. You know, he, he's always, when I would kind of tell me what to do next kind of thing, he'd get me to look at, at uh, this, this kind of faith in him, not as something to, to annihilate or get rid of, but to see the, that it, it's what I create. And, and through that you, you begin to realize that it's not about finding somebody to tell you what to do or a wise teacher that that knows exactly what you're thinking, but it's learning to trust this intuitive awareness ability we all have. Because like the, the self tends to doubt, you know, I'm not good enough. And you think, well, I've done some terrible things in the past. And, and then you might think, oh, Ajahn Sumedho, he's, he's not like me. <laughs> uh, and, and so you, these are all creations in your mind. And, that, and then the awareness of those creations.